Hey kids, Joe here. I'm back. Been a little bit distracted the last couple days with the Blandino trial. Wow. Today we have Judge Middleton. This is a hearing from way back in July. And as Law Talk with Mike would say, this one is for all you law nerds out there. It's interesting because it's basically a reverse sovereign citizen. And what I mean by that is Judge Middleton doesn't currently have jurisdiction to proceed with the case, but the defendant asks him to anyway, which is kind of strange. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. This is entitled, State of Michigan vs. Guadalupe Salvador Villafuerte Ferrar. He is represented by attorney Cirillo Martinez, who is present, and the people are represented by assistant prosecuting attorney Deborah Davis. The defendant is charged with child abuse in the second degree. Let me get to the complaint here. It is alleged that on or about November 2nd of 2020 that he did uh, commit an act that posed an unreasonable risk of harm or physical injury to a child. In fact, did result in physical harm to that child. The child left unsupervised resulting in a skull fracture. That is a felony punishable by up to two years in prison. Defendant was arrested on that charge. Um, in April of this year, arraigned at the jail on April 13th, a court appointed counsel was appointed and then Mr. Martinez uh, was retained. Pre-exam conference was set for April 27th with a preliminary examination on May 4th. Um, Mr. Martinez filed an appearance. Defendant was arrested on that very day, April 27th, by an immigration service held in Battle Creek. So the intention was to do the prelim by polycom from the Calhoun County Jail. The pre-exam conference was set for May 11th. Um, then the defendant was transferred to the St. Clair County Jail. So the plans we made to try to do the prelim on the original date failed. Um, then we contacted the St. Clair County Jail on May 6th, and they indicated that he had been deported and that's what makes this case interesting, because with the defendant deported, Judge Middleton is unable to punish him if he's found guilty. So, while Judge Middleton has what amounts to subject matter jurisdiction in this case, he doesn't currently have personal jurisdiction over the defendant. Had this been certain felonies, the state would try to extradite a defendant, but it would be a legal absurdity to try to extradite him to Michigan from Mexico when he had just been deported. And was picked up by the Immigration Service on May 4th. So the pre-exam conference was set for May 11th, and the defendant did not appear because we were advised he had been deported. So the prosecutor, I don't remember who was there, whether it was Mr. Davis, I mean, Mr. David Marvin or Deborah Davis, requested a bench warrant for defendant's failure to appear at the pre-exam conference. Even though he was in custody and had been deported, their contention was there was a hearing and through his failure or neglect, he was unable to appear for the hearing. So a bench warrant issued for his arrest and was set in the amount of $25,000 cash or surety. 
will extradite from the United States uh, and that warrant is in effect. Then there were some email as exchanged where Mr. Martinez uh, expressed concern about that resulting in his filing of a motion to quash the bench warrant. And that was filed on June 17th. The matter was set for hearing today. The bench, the motion doesn't cite any authority, but it requests the court to quash uh, the warrant uh, paragraph seven, Mr. Villafuerte Ferrar would like to move forward with this matter from Mexico and clear his name from these allegations as they are detrimental to his immigration petition filed by his mother. And that explains why the defendant wants to proceed with the case from Mexico. Under U.S. immigration law, you can't enter the country if you have certain criminal charges pending or criminal convictions. The defendant's family still lives in Michigan, and he wants to return to them. But with this hanging over his head, he can't. He's in a catch-22 where he's stuck in Mexico, unable to return because of the charges, but he can't face the charges because he can't return. And for the purposes of this commentary, he is presumed innocent. I'm not making any judgment. These are serious allegations against him, but he is still considered innocent. I'm assuming, and I think they get into it later, that he was deported because he was an undocumented immigrant. Mr. Villafuerte Ferrer would have complied with all court appearances but for being arrested by ICE prior to the case being finalized. Uh, Mr. Martinez, is that essentially your position here? Yes, Your Honor. Darren Lamps, you wish to say about it? Well, Your Honor, I think that considering that these proceedings have been ongoing via Zoom, it would be uh, feasible for this court to proceed this man uh, with a Zoom uh, trial from uh, even with Mr. Farah in Mexico. While this is impossible for the reasons I've already explained, this is quite an interesting suggestion by the defense attorney, and it would have been completely impossible before March of 2020. Well, it didn't take much effort to say that, uh, but it would take a whole lot of effort to do what you're saying. Well, here he is. Um... I believe he is uh, joining the Zoom right now. Um, I wasn't aware he was going to be here. Facilitating a preliminary examination and or trial from another state is difficult. Presume, presuming it from another country with the language barriers that exist would be even more difficult. Uh, Mr. Villafuerte Ferrari, can you hear me? Your Honor, I see him, but I... I yeah, it's um, going to take a minute. I don't know what sort of facility he's in. I believe he's in home, home in Mexico. Oh, he's not incarcerated? No, Your Honor, he was deported to Mexico. Okay. All right, I misunderstood. I thought he was in some facility. Oh no, no, you're on. He was he was sent back to Mexico. I love Judge Middleton's multilingual signs. All right, <clears throat> okay. So he's not in a facility in Mexico. He's at home in Mexico. And we're expressing some of the fundamental difficulty about just connecting. One says, turn audio on. One says, I don't know if you can read it. This is backwards.
Garner by May. Uh, Salvador, ¿me escucha? Sí. There he is, Your Honor. I, um, I think with the assistance of a translator, we would be able to get the, the matter resolved, Your Honor. It's difficult enough using a translator in court, using a translator over Zoom with international lag would be near impossible. I'd be so frustrated if I had to do it. I didn't realize he was going to be here and I didn't realize we needed a translator. I would have made provision to have one present. Um, He's making himself available to the court, Your Honor. Um, because well, he has done that. Does he speak English? Not much, Your Honor. No. Well, I'm concerned that he isn't going to understand what we're doing here. Um, as I said, I didn't know he was going to be here. I'm pleased that he's here. I would have had a translator available. Um, so we may have to re take another crack at this. Deborah, what's your position? Well, Your Honor, the motion did fail to cite any law or statute, court rule, anything um, in it other than they just want to get this resolved. Without the defendant being physically present here uh, in the state or the United States for that matter, we don't really have a, a way to have any proper jurisdiction over him if there is a decision made that uh, the case should be bound over. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do a trial. Our, our court is open now. And, and honestly, I prefer that the defendants be here in person uh, in the event there are bond violations or uh, changes in the bond. Uh, this goes back to the fact that the defendant was here illegally, uh, which is not any of our doing on the prosecution side. And it creates an issue with having to handle this case when he has not come into the United States um, appropriately, and now he's been deported. If he is able to come back here legally, then the bench warrant stands and he can deal with the case. I, I don't believe that it's appropriate to remove the bench warrant and um, whether or not he's able to get back here legally, the concern is that he told uh, the officers that he's been deported or taken back twice and he'll see us again. So. We want the bench warrant in place in the event that he does make it to the United States. As I'm sure you're all familiar by now, Ms. Davis is an excellent attorney, and she laid out the case perfectly. I, I don't really have anything else to add. There's a jurisdictional problem, and there's a warrant for a failure to appear, and none of it is due to the prosecution. It's entirely due to the defendant's actions, both what he's being tried for and and his previous actions in coming over the border illegally several times before. Your Honor, if I may respond, the, the issue here is that a, even a pending case uh, for child, child neglect or abuse under the Adam Walsh Act prohibits him from entering the United States lawfully. So that's the real issue here. Um, the, the, the prosecutor can, if they wish, uh, to dismiss the case and have the authority to refile at any moment. Um, if they would do that, um, that would also obviously be acceptable. He's making himself available to the court. He, jurisdiction, he can um, waive the jurisdiction of authority if the court, if I may, if he may, uh, or, or um, allow himself to the court to proceed with this matter, both district court and, and circuit court. Uh, so he would do that in order for him not to to resolve this this case because a child abuse, like I said, or neglect case would be detrimental to his immigration petition uh, that he's trying to move forward with. That's a creative solution by the defense attorney, but it still would never work. Under immigration law, if you've been deported as an illegal alien, you're not eligible to return for a certain time period. I believe it's 
10 years, but I'm lazy and don't want to look it up. Assuming it's 10 years, Ms. Davis couldn't refile the charges when he does return legally, because by that time, the statute of limitations is sure to have expired. So, we're still at the point where nothing can be done because nothing can be done. Well, frankly, I think that's just what Mr. Marvin wanted. I, I can't speak for him. But the petition alleges this child had eight broken ribs and a broken humerus. In, a, in, in addition to the allegations alleged in the complaint proper, he's in a catch-22. Uh, he has a bench warrant for his arrest, which prohibits him from getting into the country. Miss Davis says, well, if he wants to get here and come face the, the charge, he can do that. Well, the only way he can do it presently is, is unlawfully. Um, he'd have to break the law to get here. And their concern was that he's done that once or more times to get here in the first place. So they wanted the warrant to be outstanding to prohibit him from coming into the country. And if he did come into the country, for him to be able to be arrested which would likely lead to prompt deportation, and then we're just right back here where we started. But your position is the only way for him to come back and face these charges is to break the law. And, uh, but I think the discretion is with the prosecutor. There's no authority that you've cited that says they can't do this. As a defense attorney, sometimes you can't cite authority for what you want done, so you just have to ask the judge, will you please do this in the interest of justice? It's unlikely to work. Um, and, Ms. Davis, your position is you don't wish to dismiss the charge or recall the bench warrant? Correct. I'm concerned about the hearing that we're doing because the defendant can't hear it. He can hear it, but he can't understand it, which is the tantamount to him not being here at all. The fact that he is here demonstrates that he is a, willing to make himself available to the court. Um, but the true point of fact is he's charged with a very serious offense. Uh, he was in the country unlawfully at the time the offense was committed. The offense was apparently serious enough that the immigration service deported him. Um, it would have been nice if they'd let us, they didn't, to my knowledge, they, they certainly didn't contact the court. Uh, did they give any contact to either the defense or the prosecution? No, Your Honor, they didn't, they didn't give me any information. My understanding was that uh, the immigration used a, a, a prior removal order that was issued, uh, I believe, uh, sometime. I think I had I had, I had provided it to the court, um, but it was an old an old uh, removal order that was reinstated. The issue with with him coming back is that he will likely uh, be not only prosecuted for reentry on federal law but it would be obviously more detrimental to his immigration petition. Um, so he doesn't want to violate any more immigration laws, but he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't really see a way of resolving this case other than allowing for this case to move forward. And Ms. Davis's very expressive face is saying, I fail to see how that's my problem. Um, that is the posture that it's in. I just had a case this week, a criminal sexual conduct case that was seven years old. The prosecutor had held a warrant open for seven years, and the defendant was in another state, the state of Illinois. He was in prison, and the rules are a little different when a defendant's in prison, but this warrant remained out for seven years. The defendant did a detainer, and right now I'm still not sure how he got here but he's in the custody of the Department of Corrections, and he got here to Michigan to deal with a seven-year-old criminal sexual conduct charge.
the difference between this case and the one Judge Middleton is referring to is that the statute of limitations isn't running for the other case because there are charges filed and a warrant for his arrest is active. Whereas if the charges were dismissed in this case, that would restart the statute of limitations and by the time he could return legally, his prosecution would be barred. The facts are very similar to this, except for the fact that your client's in Mexico, not in Illinois. Um, the prosecutor has lodged the charge. They don't wish to dismiss it. They've requested a bench warrant. They don't wish to dismiss it. And you haven't cited any authority that compels me to order them to do that. Um, and it's sort of a pocket veto under this set of circumstances. This case will never be tried. Um, there's nothing that compels the court to do a Zoom trial from another country. And even if the defendant were convicted, the court wouldn't have any jurisdiction to sentence them. So there you go, sovereign citizens. In order to escape your charges, move to Mexico and go through the formal process of renouncing your U.S. citizenship. Here's a hint. You need to do it through the actual legal process. You can't just say, I'm not a citizen. And then the court might not have jurisdiction to bring you in. Although, I guess you weren't deported, so they still can extradite you. So you still lose. Sorry. Um, so, your defendant's in a difficult position. Um, you can obtain a disc of this and provide a copy to your client so you can translate what happened here. Um, you can appeal my decision to the circuit court, but Ms. Davis, I'd ask the prosecution to prepare an order that states the defendant's motion to quash the uh, bench warrant is denied. We will do that, Your Honor. Mr. Martinez, I think you have 21 days to appeal that. Right, Your Honor. Judge Tutson may have a different view of this, um, but it's a strange set of circumstances, and the defendant is between the proverbial rock and the hard place. And that's what made this hearing interesting. Um, all right, anything further we should place on the record here? No, Your Honor, I will advise him of what transpired and uh, see if he wants to proceed with the appeal. I'll notify well, the court. He's here right now. Do you wish to speak to him in a breakout room? I certainly can, Your Honor. I appreciate that. I certainly will. I'll put you guys in the breakout room, and when you're done, you can simply hang up. I you appreciate it. Now, through this connection, to speak to him face to face. Ms. Okay. Davis, you anything further for us? No, Your Honor. Um, how would you like us to submit that order? Do you want it as a seven-day? No, just submit it, and I'll sign it and share it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And there you have it. I think Judge Middleton made the right decision based on the facts. I, I think the prosecution had the facts and the law on their side. I think this was a very good defense attorney because... Frankly, he had nothing, but he was still creative and tried to find a solution. Leave a comment below. Let me know if you think it was the right decision or if you can think of a creative solution that would allow this to have continued. And as always, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.